So welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today, I am here with Stanley Henry, who is the MD, which he says is the misfit and dreamer of the Attention Seeker, which is an agency that specializes in sort of the, the whole B2B and LinkedIn space. Is that yep, right? That's it. Yep. Well, welcome. Lovely to have cool. you here. Great to be here. Um, so Stanley and I actually originally met at a place called The Chatham, which mm-hmm. is a private business club here in Auckland. Yep. And it was a 4 p.m. Friday drinks. And we yep. just happened to get chatting. And from there, you know, things have progressed. That was number of months ago now yeah. um, and you've got a really interesting story which I'd love you to share with the, the listeners yeah but before we get started I'd love to hear your professional and personal best so they can get a bit of a sense of who Stanley really is yeah cool well um, starting with the personal best now, that one's pretty easy for me that was um, giving up alcohol for a year and t- at the end of 2017 I gave it up for the whole of 2018 yep. that year changed my whole perspective on life um, coming from hospitality, which we'll learn about more later, is, yeah. I mean, that was part of my job title, is to drink great, like that was that's <laughs> yes. what you did. Um, and so giving up for a year completely transformed who I was. And I would not definitely be sitting right here right now if I hadn't have done that year. I was yeah. on a very different path in life. Uh, so that was definitely my, my professional best. It completely gave me the space to be where I am and fix my relationship with just not my partner, but my family, everyone. Yeah. Um, and then professional best, was uh, was actually starting this business it was something i'd always wanted to do i'd started little businesses in the past i had a little clothing line over in the uk and little things like that just random stuff but i never stuck to any of it yeah i didn't have the perseverance to keep going you'd get somewhere things would get hard and you'd quit and go back to work and whatever so this is the first time i really persevered which ties into the no alcohol ah, because that, that's interesting you know yeah. my brain was way clearer Yep. So I was able to stick at it, you know, I didn't have that need to just deal with stress with alcohol, which yep. then gave me an escape to get out of what I was currently doing and I'd self-sabotage and all that sort of stuff. So that's, yeah, they sort of connect they a little bit. Yeah. And you still don't drink, that's right, isn't it? You've kind of given up. I gave up again. I gave, I, I, I drank again for about a year and a half, not much, just here and there. I did it to prove I had beaten addiction the addiction and now and I got to October last year it was an election night we had a few drinks um and I decided the next day I had the first hangover I'd had in three years probably (laughs) and I was like why what what am I doing like this is a waste so I just decided at that point like I'm just going to give up and so I'll do it for at least another year and then it might be special occasions or or whatnot have an appreciate yeah. the drink you know there's I really do enjoy a really good scotch or a really f- good wine so to be able to enjoy that again will be good yes um but yes yeah, just not something that I need in my life and I don't miss it anymore fair enough mm. so the benefits obviously are on a clarity and health relationship yeah. um like especially right now building a business it's a massive positive yeah. for me because there's so much whenever I drink I get a real cloudy mind or I get distracted and go in different ways yep. even when I'm networking if you're having a drink you're quite you don't quite have the same ability to have conversations with people as well because my mind's a bit shifty everywhere not so present so yeah, uh, yeah it's just been I mean there's just so many positives I could talk about it all day but you know I'm also one of those people like I used to work in hospitality so I understand the drinker culture and I love it I love being around like you know we met at a four o'clock drinks I love (laughs) being there in the environment yeah I just don't need to consume it for myself but I love being around other people when they are and enjoying themselves Mm -hmm. it's just not a good thing for me to do to the same level I'm actually on day three of a month of, of no oh, alcohol. Yeah. So I'm giving it up for a month before my birthday. And then cool. we'll definitely have a drink on my birthday. But nice. yeah, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, let's go. <laughs> okay. So you've got a really interesting story because you actually come from the hospitality industry, as, mm-hmm. you, uh, as you indicated. So tell us a little bit about, you know, what you were doing and how mm. you got to be to where you are now. Yeah. So I, I worked in hospitality for about 15 or so years. Yep. Um, I started off at the Sky Tower. I was up at the observatory restaurant, oh, the yeah. buffet restaurant. That was my first job. That was classic. I'm at you uni needed need some money um but then i took off to australia sort of ran away from problems here in new zealand took off to uh, to australia and fell back into hospitality it was the only jobs i could get Um, at the time i was young 21 and i had a really really good boss and he ended up becoming a really good friend of mine really good mentor vikas and he pulled me aside one day and just said you know what are you doing with your life like do you want a career is this going to be a career where you just hit a party what's the deal uh he's like and I said look I'd love to do more I just didn't realize I had a choice you know like I just you know I didn't realize there was anyone saw that in me either that I could be something okay and he said look if you want it I'll do it but you gotta commit and so I went away for the day thought about it 
don't know why it took a day to figure it out <laughs> went back and said yep look let's do this i want this and okay. so he uh just progressively put me in harder and harder positions until i just learned more and more and then i eventually worked uh i had 11 positions in 12 years i think it was um and my last role was i was general manager of a hotel in melbourne yeah. uh so you know i had some pretty cool roles you know looking after like 200 staff 15 million so of revenue things like that and yeah you know i sort of say that now and i meet a lot of business owners who've got quite good businesses and they're like really like that much revenue at that age and like it's kind of a I didn't quite realize at the time the gravity of what I was doing. Yep. Now that I'm in my own business, I'm like, well, I'd love a $15 million <laughs> revenue to look after now. Yes. Um, but yeah, so I didn't really understand the gravity of what I was doing, but it taught me so much. In hospitality, you have to do everything. And what were the biggest challenges? Because I mean, that's a, that's a huge yeah. number of staff for a young person and, and budget-wise as well. So what were the biggest yeah. challenges in, in man, general manager role? Uh, my biggest challenges, so in the start of my about six months into my general manager position is when I first gave up alcohol for the first time. Yep. Um, my biggest challenge was to separate myself away from the peers or my, I guess, staff is probably the better way to do it. Yep. I used to think of them as peers and professional peers, but I had to realize that I was so much more than that now. And it wasn't to be arrogant. It was just that they looked at me differently. Mm -hmm. I was no longer just staying one of their mates as F&B manager or whatever. Yep. I was now the GM and I would talk to staff who were new and you know young or even be attendants or whatever and they i talked to them in a way that i would talk to anyone normally but i forgot the gravity that my or the power that an authority that my position held yeah and that was a real struggle and i probably ruined a few relationships or maybe slowed the development of people because i didn't respect the office i held um and once i figured that out it was way better because then i could give people more yep. actually because i I could give them what they needed and and it's hard to explain but i had to stop being just one of the one of the lads almost and yep. be the leader that these people needed absolutely um, and that was a massive turn but it was a real challenge at first but when i figured that out it changed a lot and is that sort of a learning you're going to take into your own business now as well oh, yeah. Yep. yeah massive like i even still may make some mistakes now about it like the first day of one of my new staff when she started you know our offices half home half office yep. and on her first day uh you know we made jokes about how you know doors open at nine because claire's probably still naked <laughs> so dumb like when i think about it now it's just, just such a stupid thing to have said yes um for her she was obviously like who is claire i don't even know that's your partner right to the staff come in and get naked <laughs> Like what's going on? Where have I started? Yeah, yeah, where is this place? It's the first day, and you can imagine like how nervous she felt at that point. So I put her in a really compromised position, which was just so stupid. Mm -hmm. And it was just because I wasn't thinking the gravity or the authority my my position held as the owner of this company. Yes. And so that was a big learning. That was again, it was as a throwback to what I used to do as a GM. Right. It's just one of those things. Like as long as Stan, you want to be friends with people, but you are also their boss. Yeah. And, and so, they look up to you. You're yeah, the leader, right? That's yep. it. You're the leader. So there is something there that you've got to make sure you keep that distance, not to close the relationship, but you actually, you've got a different relationship to peers. Mm -hmm. You know, so my staff will talk to each other maybe in that way and they yeah. can have those jokes, but I can't do the same style of joke. It's just not right. So yeah. it's something I'm continually remembering. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Now you started back, when was it? October, 2019. It mm -hmm. was just yourself at that point. Yeah. First of all, what on earth possessed you to go from what I assume <laughs> would be quite a well-paid job in a great uh, environment in Melbourne to go and start your own business? <laughs> oh, look, um, th there was always a need to do something myself. Like I've, I've always had that entrepreneurial sort of spirit. I've had multiple little hustles on the side and yep. And, and around the place, but it was always saying I wanted to do. And, and to tell you the truth, this, the silly idea that goes inside my head is that one day there's going to be technology that allows us to live forever and I'm not going to be able to afford it on a salary. I'm going to need to be <laughs> super rich to be able to do it. And I'm not going to get super rich unless I own my own business. Right. That's honestly, that's, that's, right, yeah. that's honestly what goes through my head. Um, so it's, it's just a way of like, I needed to do this. Yes. I needed to have the, I needed to prove I could do it or prove that I couldn't do it. I needed to know, yep. was it viable or not? And I was in a right good space because I wasn't drinking. Um, and so it was the time was right. right. I had achieved what I wanted to in hospitality. I would have just continued on that path and kept going. Yep, money was great. We had a great apartment. We had a great life. Claire had a great job. 
uh, it was it was a decision that was like, all right, if we don't do this, let's get settled. Yeah. Let's really put some roots in somewhere and, you know, do the the married kids buy a house that life. Mm-hmm. And neither Claire and I were ready for that. It's just not what we wanted. We're not those sorts of people. Yeah. Uh, so that so all those things put rolled together. It was like, all right, let's do it. And then the inciting sort of incident was my owners of my hotel called me while I was away on holiday and in, in emails just abusing that I wasn't there looking after the hotel even though the hotel, hotel had great staff we'd smashed every record we'd ever set in January and yet yeah, they were just mad that I left my post yep. they wanted me there no matter what even though it'd been two and a half years since I'd taken a holiday uh, so I was like why are we doing this like why are we I put in all my effort into this role I treat this hotel like I own it yeah, this is how we're treated. This is always going to be that. Let's let's do it. Mm. And then the next day, after we decided that, my brother emailed me and the other, my other brothers saying, hey, we're going out on our own. We started a brokerage. If anyone wants a job, let me know. I'd love to help you guys build your own business. And so me and Claire like, well, that's a sign if we ever seen one. So we took it. Things got to where they were. Yeah. Claire decided to do that. I decided to go out on my own knowing I couldn't do that and probably shouldn't have worked with my brother. Um which is probably for the better. Um, but I also had so much other stuff I wanted to do. I couldn't just do one thing. I needed to let my mind like play a little bit and talk to people and see. Um, so yeah, October, we moved back to New Zealand and kicked it off. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and now, now we've got what, six people and we're looking for new premises and yeah. and, they, and you still got two job, two job offers at the moment, or two jobs out there at the moment, haven't you? Yeah, that's it. So it's been pretty wild ride. We're growing pretty fast. Yep. Um, and Yep. So we got yeah two looking for two staff at the moment um, and potentially three, but um, we, we're sort of bringing the creative side of, of our business in house. Yeah. Um, and yep, looking for, we need premises because our current half office, half home is not going to be big enough. For, Especially not with naked Claire's around. No, yet. not with naked Claire's <laughs> in it. So we definitely need somewhere bigger yeah. and uh, and and just a better environment for the team as well, a place they can call their own as well that they can come and go as they need i know that that's really important for them they mostly work from home but they need a space that they can call their own and it's not my house yeah. as well um, so it's really important but yeah yeah we're definitely definitely looking to grow um i reinvest everything we earn so you know i pay myself a salary and outside of that everything else just goes back into to grow it yeah um, I don't, I'm not in it for the money. I'm in it for the growth, actually. I want the biggest team I can get. I'm going to get back to that 200-person team I used to have. Yes. Uh, so that's Why? What do you like about managing a team? Oh, I love I love leading people. Yeah. I, I love, like, watching people grow. Mm-hmm. Um, some of my favourite moments or some of my best memories of hospitality are seeing ex-employees leave and go off and do amazing things you know we've got yeah. some of the staff have opened up like award-winning restaurants or some have gone on to become general managers and things and when i first met them you could see the spark in them but they hadn't quite had the leader to mold them and put them in the right way and not that i was the be all and end all but you know i like to think that there was a part of what i did help them through that journey mm-hmm. um, and also when they're with us like when they're with you just seeing them grow from someone maybe shy and doesn't come out of the shell to someone who's like complete boss and takes over everything. You know, I just love yeah. it. I don't know. There's just something about um, leading, like leading people is the most fun I have in my role. Yeah. I, I would do it all day long if I could. And mm-hmm. that's where I hope to get to in my role is just have a team. I can just do that with. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, people looking from the outside and will go, wow, that's amazing. You know, you've gone from one person to potentially mm. nine people mm. in, in under two years. Mm. Has it all been a bed of roses? Has it all nah. been, you know, it's, it's easy, right? We just grow like that. <laughs> nah, nah, not at all. And it's still not. Yes. Um, growing pains are a thing. So that's, as you grow, there's heaps of challenges. Yep. But even just in the beginning, I mean, we all had COVID and all of us had that to go through. That was tough first six months wiped off all my business yeah. everything I'd been building start again um, and then as it built uh, and I and I took on some more people and I got some staff on board uh, there was other challenges there was challenges okay now we've sold all this how do we deliver it do we have the process for it you know we're figuring out things as we go yeah. you know there's a lot of smoke and mirrors in small business that yep we can do it we, you, you sell the dream of what you can do not what you're currently doing mm-hmm. and you have to do that because you know you can do it, but you just haven't been paid the money yet to do it. Yeah. And so you just have to sell that you can, get it, and prove it along the way. 
that's my model. Some, you know, there is a model, obviously, do it slower and steadier and safer. I get it. Um, in hospitality, I've always run and rolled with the punches. So I've been able to always flex like that yeah. and move. Um, but for me, one of the biggest things was that start of this year, we, we, we launched some new products. We sold lots of them. We took a lot of clients on. And it was too many to the point where my staff were saying, Stan, if you, if you sell any more, we're quitting. Like, we're out. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay, okay, let's slow down. But then at the same time, I decided to hire a new staff member to sell more, a salesperson, my first salesperson. Um, and there was just a lot of dumb decisions at the time that I probably should have taken it slower. And yep. so it was real hard. And sometimes too much business is just as bad as not enough. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was on the borderline of that. Okay. Um, I pulled through, obviously, we got to here, uh, but it was a real good lesson to go, yep, moving fast is good yeah. and taking those risks is great, but taking five at one time is stupid. Yes. You know, doing one or two at a time is great. Take that risk, hire that person when maybe you don't yet have the revenue to support them full on, yeah. but doing multiple people plus new projects and new services and all this sort of stuff all at the same time, that's yeah, that's silly. And I, and I, I made all those decisions isolated as yeah. opposed to thinking of it holistically. Uh, so that's the biggest lesson I've learned so far. Just when you make a decision before you act, I've got this thing on my computer now. It's like a, it's a wiki in my teams and I put all my business ideas down oh, yes. that I've got Yep. and I just put them in there and I dump them in and then I leave it. And if I come back and read it, it's probably worthwhile investigating, but there's a few on there now that I've just put in walked away and forgot all about them. Yep. But before I would have went, oh, this is that. We need to go do this and tell everyone to start doing something. You strike me as being a typical, we call a visionary. Yeah. And we always describe a visionary <laughs> as being the person who is absolutely essential for the business, right? The business wouldn't yeah. even be here and it certainly wouldn't grow without them. But they're the one that goes around the weekend and comes back and goes, oh, I've got this fantastic idea. We're now going to sell stuffed elephants. And, then, <laughs> and of course, the whole team jumps in and starts building stuffed elephants. And then you come back a week later and go, actually, you know, I decided stuffed elephants weren't the way to go. We're now yeah. going to do stuffed pigs, you know? Yeah. And so it's, it's very, um, it can be really inspirational people get behind visionaries because of the strong vision they've got but it yeah. can actually be quite destructive in terms of the team not knowing yeah. what's real and what's not yeah yeah absolutely and that was definitely where we were even just three or four maybe four months ago three yeah. or four months ago um we were at that point i was right on the border if i had a pushed any harder we would have crossed it and it would have been over i was lucky luckily in the, in the middle of it all i realized what i'd done yeah um and, and and you know a lot of that's thanks to people like yourself and drew and things that we always meet and we talk a lot we, yeah. we've got a real strong network of people who are in business so hearing other people's stories i was able to reflect on my own yeah. i think if i was doing it isolated without people around me i would have not seen the imploded yeah because <laughs> yeah. I, I couldn't have seen it yeah i couldn't have seen what i was doing but because i heard other people's talking about stuff i was like oh i'm doing that too yeah damn it <laughs> So it's interesting. What you know? What sort of support structures have you got around you? Obviously, we have our peer groups, which yeah. is great. What What have you done? What have you changed? I suppose because you could you were in real danger of actually imploding and mm. people walking out on you. Yeah. So what did you do to change that and start putting structure in place? Yeah, I I I made the decision that uh, we were going to do less revenue for a couple of months. Yeah. I understood that that was just going to be something I had to take all the profits I had earned and use that to sustain us for two months um, without trying to take on too many new, well, any new clients. So that was the first thing is slow the business down, yep. slow the intake of clients. Uh, so that was step one. Step two was to uh, really, really work on the process, just completely rip apart all the process, all the systems, everything we did from an operational point of view and just pull it down to the mi most minute details. And we joke about how I made my staff like, list like grab the mouse with your right hand put your finger on the your left finger on the clicker yeah. click the mouse you know stuff like that and we broke it down so granular so we could find out all the steps we could remove and right. so mouse clicks as an example we can use tools like zapier to to remove all those mouse clicks yeah they're not needed and it also removes that error um as well right because anything yeah. that requires a human involvement can actually lead to error yeah it can exactly it can lead to error you forget to do it or you know you get busy and you can't do stuff and so the more we can streamline that process and put these I guess operating systems in your language to, together yeah. is um, it made everything work a lot better. So my team were no longer stressed. They could turn around clients faster, which was better service for the customer, mm -hmm. um, but also better for the business because then as we turn those clients around, their monthly retainers kick in. And so that setup process of getting them onboarded went from 
you know, we're at one point we're at six to eight weeks getting someone on board to now realistically we can probably turn them around in two weeks now. Okay. And so that means that for me, the revenue is better because month two starts faster than, yes. than we did <laughs> before, you know? Yeah. So all that sales you did, you start, and, and that's better for the business and um, your monthly retainers start, you know, start skyrocketing and which allows you to think, okay, now I've got this much monthly retainers that are locked in for at least this period of time. Let's hire some staff to keep the growth happening. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was definitely a big piece. And in my support network, like there was commu- like lots of community. I think when I tell people the amount of communities I'm a part of and like fully invested in, yeah. they're always quite surprised. So they, you know, they might say, "Oh, I've got the, yeah, I've got my BNI, or I've got this network," and I'm like, "Yeah, I've got my BNI, my New Zealand leaders, my North Harbour Connector, my Asian network, my Friday four o'clock." You know, like yes. I've got, and it's not just that I'm an attendee. I don't just turn up. No, you know, really an active, really part of, active those, part of it. Yeah. 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 So I, how do you manage that then? Because that, that there is a, a strong time commitment there. Yeah. Do you have a a method for making sure that you can commit that time? Yeah, I think so. So my, my main role in the business is obviously sales and strategy. Yeah. So they always, um, so the sales strategy and then the community part, and that's really all my time. And so okay, it's strong calendar uh, is, is just paramount. You can't do it without using a calendar for everything. Yeah. Blocking out the time you need. So I always have my email blocks yes. morning and afternoon. Lunch is always blocked out because I love to eat. <laughs> um, and uh, having everything I need. And then so I only have about five hours a day I can block out with clients. Yeah. Um, obviously, if it's a discovery session, it's going for four hours. I might go over lunch, but that's okay because we'll have lunch at the, at the session. session. Yeah. Um, and then once that's all in place, the networking, if you do it right, should be regular and expected. Yes. So B and I for you is every Friday morning. You need your networks yeah. once a month, etc. Exactly. Et cetera. Yeah. So you know when they are. Yeah. So they're already in your calendar. Yeah. And so all your other meetings are just around it. Mm-hmm. Um, and part of that process was getting a really strict sales process. With the sales process we have now, we, we had Alex McNaughton come on and help us put that together. Is that we never not know where someone is. We never have something booked in. We never not have something booked in. With, a prospect. So there's always a next step. Always a next step. Yep. Always a clear future of what's happening next. And that means we never have to sit around going, where do we go? Yeah. There's things that we just got to turn up to the meeting. Yep. There's a meeting booked. After so that it's meeting, a process again, really, isn't it? All process. Yeah. Everything's process. And I suppose, I mean, working with a number of clients, they often want to yeah get into huge amounts of detail, which mm. is admirable, but then they kind of get stuck because they're waiting for it to get to 100% perfect before they mm. actually go out there and do something with it. Yeah. We always say, hey, look, think about the 20% of the processes that actually offer the most value to your business. Yeah. And then if you put those, get those right, it'll yeah. give you 80% of the results. Is yep. that similar in your business absolutely yep yeah 100 um even when you're breaking down the process uh i i get the staff to break it down probably the last so i'll do the 20 percent with them yep that gets in the most and then they'll do the rest of the 80 over time yeah and never and, it, and it's you're never going to get all the 80 they'll keep on tweaking it because we'll improve it because yep. we'll get it and we're like oh that's great we got there but we could do this better so let's add that in yep. uh Nisha Network's a really good example. We do that's a monthly cycle for us and the team. And we're constantly changing that process all the time, just taking it to another level. What yeah. more can we do? How much better, you know, last time. I mean, it seems silly for us now, but like last month was the first time we had a microphone for the speakers. Okay. You know, yeah. it just seems, well, you've got speakers every month, you know, just things like that that you don't see, you know, you mm. can't see it, but you just keep improving. Yeah. Um, but the 20% I took care of yeah. and that built the Asian into what it is. Yes. Um, now the team are really refining the 80 and they're going to continue. Yeah. yeah so. so how do you keep track of those things? So remember when I used to run the event center, um, I, I had a, a very high standard that I wanted to run things at. And so I literally started that process of this is what you need to do. So when you come yeah. into the room, you need to make sure that the diffusers are on. You need to make sure that all of the, the books are laid out in a yeah. certain way. I mean, I got quite quite anal about it, but that's yeah. because I, I wanted to have a great experience. Um, we just did it with a, a literally a checklist yeah. that somebody had to go through and kind of tick off as they're working through it. Yeah. And that worked because in an event space, they are physically on the floor. It was easy to have a piece of paper and a pen. Yeah. Do you, What do you use to keep track of your, because they are always changing. And what yeah. I found, was that checklist changed yeah. as we recognize more things that we could do to improve it? Yeah. Well, I mean, the first piece to that puzzle, if we're thinking events, is three of us, me, Claire, and Alicia, all come from this world. So for yeah. a lot of it, it's second nature to us because we've done so much of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but but one, you're not always going to be there, though, right? No, no, we're not. And so it was helpful that Alicia sort of owns that process now. Yeah. Um, and Claire 
more that she works in the business that is her whole background she's done every major event you can think of she's done it all from yep. movie premieres premieres to all sorts so there's a innate ability there just from experience yep. but um it's just a constant we have a, a beo a banquet event orders or an event order yep. oh, we don't really do banquets i suppose um but that's just old terminology from hotel days so we have a template we use now alicia populates it we all add to it we have a group chat where everything goes in um it, the Nisian goes into our project management tool with all our other clients. So it gets treated like a, a client. Yeah. Um, so it's not just something we do on the side. It's it's probably part of it. It's a client we serve. That's yeah. how we think of it. Um, but still, there is so much that we have to do. We're, we're still only probably 50% of it figured out. Yeah. Um, so to your point, the 20% of it is rock solid. Yeah. We know we can run a good event. Yes. That's good. The 80%, the, the, the finesse is not anywhere near done. Yeah. There but is so much room. Over time. Yeah, yeah. Always. Yeah. But I think you made a really valid point there. And we talk about right people, right seats. Having somebody whose innate ability enables them to do the job is really important as yeah. well. You know, you need to have somebody who actually gets it, yeah. uh, really wants to do it and yeah. has that um, capacity to do it as well. Yeah. yeah. And Alicia is a, like, you know, to Drew's models here, she's a producer. She just loves to tick stuff off and get it done. Yeah. You give her a list of things are done and they'll be done before you can hand the rest of the list over. She just gets through stuff. Yes. Um, so she's the right person to do that. Yeah. I'm the right one to think of what are the possibilities yes. that we can come up with. <laughs> <laughs> but we've learned now when I, when I think of those possibilities, I have to sit with her and hand them over properly. Yeah. And so our project management tool, which all our clients go in, that's a new thing for us in the last few months mm -hmm. where the salesperson and the strategy person sits with the account manager and they're not allowed to leave that conversation until the account manager takes ownership of the person until they're like, yeah, I 100% know what I need to do moving forward. Yeah. Um, because it used to be just like, hey, I've signed Deborah. This is that. She needs this. Can you get make it happen? And they're like, what is <laughs> Make what happen? Make what happen, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so now it's like, no, Stan, tell me everything that's in your head step by step. Yeah. And we put that in. And so the same thing happens with Nisha and all sorts. And once Alicia has that, she's like, yep, I'm away running yeah so process 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 and people. Yep, <laughs> yeah absolutely okay cool now obviously you do have a personal life um, yep. you've mentioned uh, your your partner claire and whatnot how do you make sure that your business doesn't completely take over your life um there's you know there's a couple things here one is that uh it is so much fun for me yep. so it is how i uh as my entertainment yes. as well so that's something that a lot of people don't understand as well. Like a lot of people, business isn't there. It's a means to an end. Mm -hmm. For me, it's what I want to do for fun. Yeah. I want to do business. And if it's not doing my business, it's doing other people's business or, you know, that. So that's the first thing. So for me, my downtime playing in business is fun for me. Yeah. Um, but obviously that's not for Claire. Mm -hmm. And so Claire's not at all a business person. <laughs> she, not, she works to work. And so I have to be able to, one, allocate time with her as in turn off at this time. Yeah. Okay, dinner's ready, turn the computers off, go back to Claire. Weekends, we often um, will allocate things, we'll, you know, we'll plan stuff, do stuff. Um, and then also Claire's really good at um, understanding where we are in this business journey to say, look, we're building for a future where um, we do like the old cliche of entrepreneurship, right? Like we're doing the things no one else will do so we can do the things that no one else can later on. Yeah. And so she understands that idea. And because we've had some success to date, she can see that future really clearly now. So she's given me the space to work more than maybe what she would like me to. Yeah. With the promise that, you know, we start to pull back. And we already have. Yeah. Now that we've got the process and we've got more staff, I don't have to execute as much as I used to at the beginning. <laughs> yep. I was doing all the stuff I did now plus execution. So now I don't. And so, you know, like I would probably only actually work in the business maybe 50 hours a week like I actually don't work heaps yeah um none of my meetings start before 10 a.m unless they're something really urgent but very rarely does that ever happen um and no meetings after four as well so yep. that's my email times and that which means I can close off my day I always close off the day that's a big thing okay so that tell you, me what that means so that means there's nothing pending that hasn't got something in the calendar yeah so if, it, if it's if I can't get it done today then I need to be honest with the client, tell them when it is due. Yeah. Or if I, yeah, so I, I need a due date on stuff not getting done today. Mm -hmm. That way, when I stop and I have dinner with Claire, my mind's with her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. if you're still trying to close off the day, yeah. you won't sleep. 
I actually something similar, but I do at the end of the evening, I actually plan out my next day as well. So that when I go to sleep, I'm not suddenly waking up at 3 a.m. Yeah. going, oh my goodness, I've forgotten that I need to do that. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. It's good. Okay. I think it's so important. Perfect. Yeah. Hey, look, I could talk to you for hours, but yeah. we're kind of coming to the end of the, the podcast. In terms of, we like to give some really practical tips mm-hmm. and pragmatic tips people can actually use in their everyday business. So yeah. what are the three tips you'd like to share with the listeners? Yeah, I, th- I think for me, what my three big things that helped my career was um, really developing my reputation and personal brand. And yep. It's obviously what we do as a business, but we do it as a business because it works and it, it's worked for me and it's really helped my business grow it's the reason we've grown because you didn't actually have the networks and things when you first came back from australia, uh, from australia did you no i've been gone for 12 years i had no yeah. networks okay. and so it was like <laughs> literally zero i knew a couple handful of client, um uh, star uh students what yeah. am i talking about school school friends school friends yeah. school friends okay. yeah uh so it was just network 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 build up your personal brand both in person and digital they work combined mm-hmm. which then is the second point is network the hell out of everything like yeah. don't think networking is this weird thing you have to do and stand in a corner like it's it can be really fun and really collaborative if you just put your effort into it i'm super introverted i hate going to networking events still but once i'm there so the hour beforehand i always fret about it but once i'm there and i realize like oh this is great these are a bunch of business people and i love business let's talk business it gets really fun and there's other things you can talk about and don't talk about business Mm -hmm. um and the third thing is process like take your business and pull it apart in terms of the process and just map it down to the most minute detail and you'll find that a lot of people people that a common thing and you'll see this in your business is that i'm too busy i've got too much to do i'm always stuck at work and all these sorts of things i work 100 hours a week or whatever mm-hmm. and it's because you haven't mapped out your process yeah. and because you haven't mapped it out you can't hand it over yeah. and i said it's also about having the right person you can hand it over to too yeah. so you can get those two things right yeah that's when you can really let go exactly and 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 to double that out and that same tip is when you hand it over, trusting the person that you give it to. Yeah. You can always put out a fire. Yeah. Just give them a trust, trust them to do their job. If they're external, if they're internal, whatever, just give it to them. If they make a mistake, fix it. Yeah. You can always fix it. Like you can always get more customers if you really screw up a customer. <laughs> but if you don't trust the other person, you're never going to be able to hand it over. Yeah. It's always going to be there. And then what's the point you should have just done it yourself? Exactly. Yeah. I love it. Perfect. Thank you. Hey, look, if anybody wants to get in contact with you about the work you do at Attention mm-hmm. Seeker, what's the best way to get hold of you? Uh, just jump on LinkedIn. And if you're in Auckland, you'll probably not stop seeing me everywhere. <laughs> um, but yeah, just search Stanley Henry on LinkedIn. Otherwise, atten- theattentionseeker.com. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah, well, cool. look, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thank um, you. I look forward to yeah, catching up with you throughout the journey and, yeah. and hopefully we can get some EOS put in there yeah, as well. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Stanley. Cheers.